boat to the north end of Winnipesaukee. Apparently, at some point, both the drowns and mother and dad had indicated that they might like to have some property on the lake. And one day, in passing the area where Tomba Lane now exists, Mr. Banfield pointed to it and said that is probably one of the choicest spots on Winnipesaukee, but unfortunately it is not for sale. Mr. Drown happened to be in the real estate business and he wouldn't take that for an answer. So sometime in the summer of 1924, when mother and dad were visiting mother's mother in Colorado Springs, they received a telegram from Ed Drown saying, have purchased 800 feet of property on Winnipesaukee. Would you be interested? Mother and dad must have wired back and said yes, because on their return to Newton, they made a trip to the Wolfboro, Tuftonboro area with the drowns and divided the land 50 50. Uh, the drowns taking the southern portion because Mr. Drown wanted to be able to see the mountains, and Mother took the northern portion because she said it was higher and drier, and she had a group of young children for whom that would be important. The Drowns built their cottage on the southern half the winter of 24-25 and occupied it in the summer of 25. Mother and Dad had to delay the work on their cottage because of Barbara's arrival in June of 1924. So their cottage was constructed in the winter of 25-26. And June 26 was the first time we moved in. One story that may or may not be true is that parents, our parents said this was a cottage they thought would be used occasionally on weekends. But during our first summer, we arrived as soon as school was out in June. We stayed until school opened in September, and the house was full of relatives and friends all summer. Okay. Well, I can remember the, the first uh, summer uh, because the, the yard, first of all, was full of little scraps of wood that the carpenters had left around. And uh, one of our jobs was to go around and pick up all the little pieces of wood and uh, put it where it could be brought in to be used in the fireplace. Uh, I also remembered that the yard, uh, instead of being smooth as it is today, was full of, of stones. It was a very rocky area. And uh, John and I were put to work uh, uh, getting some of the stones out. Uh, so after we had pretty well cleared stones out of the yard, it turned out that now we had a lot of holes in the ground. So next, uh, mother and dad had uh, a bunch of uh, dirt brought in, which the local farmer called loam but it didn't seem to have many of the characteristics of loam. However, it uh, did fill in the holes, and uh, it, uh, every time it rained, it, it became very muddy. So mother and dad consulted with the people here and were persuaded that the thing to do was to plant some grass, and that was done. Uh, so uh, when the grass came up, we had a nice lawn. But then that, uh, the grass grew, and uh, somehow the grass had to be mowed from time to time. <laughs> so John and I had the task of, of mowing it with a push lawnmower, which is still in the garage. 
And when we came back the next year, the, uh, right after school, the grass had grown to be about a foot and a half high. So we went to work with a scythe and cut it all down and then raked it up. And after that, we were able to mow it all summer. And uh, that, so that was the, the, the first summer. At the same time, Barbara was uh, sitting in her playpen watching all of this and, and chirping happily uh, as the work progressed. I have to correct something that John said. I actually arrived in 1925. He gave me an extra year of life, <laughs> which I don't need. Uh, I guess my first recollection of coming up here is the long car ride from, from uh, Newton. There were no super highways in those days. I guess there were no highways at all. I, I know we had to take a route that took us through, when we left from Newton, we went through Watertown. Uh, what was the next town? Winchester. Uh, no, I don't think we ever went to Winchester. Uh, well, Lexington quite often. Lexington. Uh, the route kept changing. So you so just went some, from town to town. There was, there was one turnpike Sometimes we took the Newburyport Turnpike and came up through Dover and uh, then to Sanbornville. And the trip took, uh, I suppose, about eight hours in the beginning, didn't it? And every, every uh, Monday, Dad would go down to Boston to spend the week in, in Boston. And I think in the very beginning he could get on a train in Wolfboro, but by the time I really remember, uh, we had to take him to Sanbornville, and that's about that was about 25 minutes or half an hour from here in those days. So we would take him over to Sanbornville, and then we would go and pick him up on Friday, and uh, along about Tuesday, Mother would start thinking about the guests she'd like to have that weekend. Now we didn't have a phone in those days, so this required going going down to the post office at Mirror Lake, and in those days it was Ernie Piper's post office, which was just barely off Route 109. Ernie also had a general store, and he was a great guy. Hugh can tell you more about Ernie, perhaps. We would go down to the phone booth at Mirror Lake, and this was a big treat for me. I always loved <coughs> going with mother to the phone booth, and we would call dad, and uh, mother would give him a list of the people he was supposed to phone that night to invite them up, and if uh, friend A couldn't do it, then he would move to friend B, and sometimes he would have to go as far as friend C or D. Anyway, uh, that was his, his little chore to, to line up the guests for the weekend. Of course, there were some who had standing invitations, and those were probably planned well in advance, but many weekends uh, were not planned in advance. They were more or less last minute. <clears throat> and that's the way we handled those, those guests. When those guests came up here, they didn't just... Uh, sit around and look at the view and rock on the porch. They took boat rides with us. They had that form of recreation and they, they put on all their more or less heavy bathing outfits and took dips in the lake. Now, none of mother and dad's friends were great, great swimmers, but uh, they took their dips in the lake However, between those modest enjoyments, they spent a great deal of time helping us develop the property, and that involved cutting down trees, that involved digging holes for posts to make bridges, uh, that involved hauling wood for the fireplace. Guests were expected to do that kind of thing. It wasn't as though we had to ask them, they, they simply knew what their what the expectations were. <laughs> now, can someone elaborate on that? 
Well, they built or helped to build steps to the boathouse. Uh, somebody worked on the incinerator that we used for burning garbage. In those days, we had no weekly trash pickup, and we had to dispose of our trash up in the woods, rather than, and in the beginning, we just would dig a large hole, and by the end of the summer, it would be pretty well filled up, but <clears throat> as the number of people staying here grew, we needed more than that, so somebody came up with the idea of building a, an incinerator, a sizable cement affair that was probably over three feet square and about four feet high. Well, John, I discovered the plans for that incinerator in Popular Science magazine and uh, showed that to Dad and Mother, and they thought it sounded like a good idea. So that's how we happen to have the incinerator. But I think we should uh, talk first about the fact that this wasn't just in the sticks, but it was in the sticks behind the sticks. We had no electricity, uh, but we, uh, and, and no public water, of course, so we had to get our water from the lake. Uh, we, at, at first, my, uh, my recollection is that we had a pump that had a long handle on it, and you'd, rack, uh, you'd rock the handle back and forth, and that would actuate the pump. It would pump water up to a tank, and, and then we uh, were able to have faucets that, that uh, water ran out of. But also, uh, when we first got here, we didn't have electricity, but uh, uh, public electricity, but we had a generator and a whole bunch of batteries. And uh, we could run the uh, generator for a couple hours, and it would charge the batteries up and up, so it would last several days. But we had to keep repeating that at least two or three times a week. The electricity was adequate for lights, but it uh, wasn't adequate enough for any appliances like a refrigerator uh, and, uh, uh, or uh, electric irons or anything like that. Uh, the, the way we kept food cold was with ice from the ice house. And in the, in the, in the winter time, uh, mother and dad got one of the local farmers to go out on the lake and cut blocks of ice, uh, which they then put in the ice house packed in sawdust. Mm -hmm. And uh, the blocks would be spaced a little bit apart so that the sawdust would fall down in the crack between the blocks, and then uh, when we were ready to take them out in the summertime, uh, uh, they, they would come out quite easily. Uh, John and I had the, the job of getting the, the ice out of the ice house, ice house and bringing it in to put it in the refrigerator. Where was the ice house? The, the, uh, the, uh, the ice house was the, the east side of what is now the garage. And when they, 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 they put the ice in there, uh, the, the, the door, uh, there, there was a door uh, that could be open, and inside the door there was a slot. And board, as the stack of ice grew up, they would put boards uh, down into the slot, which covered the, the, the opening, so that uh, at the beginning of the, of the summer, the, uh, we had to go up pretty high in the ice house to, to get into, the, into where the ice was. Uh, and gradually, as we removed the ice from the ice house, the, the opening got lower and lower. Uh, but the, uh, the ice was, uh, was pretty heavy. And uh, we used a, a pair of tongs to, to pick up the ice. Now, I guess I'm a little ahead of myself because the first couple of years, John and I weren't old enough to do this. And one of the neighbor's boys came over to dig the ice out. 
after two or three years, I guess John and I were were strong enough to lift a 50-pound cake of ice and, and and bring it out and take it over to the to the ice house. You were six and seven when you first came here. Yes, I guess. that's about right. So, Hugh, the box into which the blocks of ice would be put is still on the terrace behind the kitchen. It's a green four-foot square box. I think maybe we ought to talk a little bit about what you and I would do to while away our time. First of all, you've already referred to taking stones and rocks out, some of them which eventually wound up on the breakwater, but you and I also trimmed the trees at uh, the phenomenal rate of something like 10 cents an hour, and the money that we collected from for that in the morning, we would then spend on gasoline for the little two-cylinder hand crank outboard motor that was on the stern of a rowboat. And running around in the bay was one of our favorite forms of recreation. We also became interested in sailing and constructed a Latin sail that we put on the canoe along with a set of lee boards and that was the first step in what eventually became quite a bit of sailing activity on both your part and mine. Well, that's right, John. And uh, I remember uh, there was a gentleman who was uh, renting a room from the drowns across the field, and he was in the the uh, cotton business. He uh, he dealt in cotton cloth, and he got us some some uh, cloth that we could use to make a sail, and we we uh, we put that all together, and we had sailed pretty well. But we decided after a while the boat didn't go fast enough, so we made the sail a lot bigger. <laughs> and then we found that as soon as we got out in the boat, it turned over. <laughs> so we had to reduce it back to where it had begun to begin with. Uh, also, uh, after a few years, the uh, little outboard that we had on the back of the rowboat was inadequate. So uh, our father arranged for us to get a, a faster uh, boat with a, with a great big powerful engine on it. It was a 16 horsepower engine and, uh, uh, and that would go pretty fast. Uh, it also used up gas a lot faster so that meant that we had a lot more pressure to, to, to trim the trees in, <laughs> in the woods. Uh, and we, we spent a lot of time at that. The, uh, and, and somewhere along the line, Dad decided that we should uh, have our education uh, furthered by learning how to sail in a real sailboat. So he acquired a sailboat uh, from a boatyard in Amesbury, uh, and uh, we, we would uh, sail around in that boat. We had a lot of interesting times. Uh, I remember one time we were here in September, uh, the week before school started, and uh, we got out in the broads and, and there was a very high wind, and the next thing we knew we had turned over out in the middle of the broads. Uh, but we, we were patient, we uh, were being washed down toward one of the islands, and when we got to the island, it was all pretty rocky, but we found a little beach. And we got the boat up on the beach and pulled on the halyard to tip the boat uh, over so that we got the water to run out of it. And uh, after that, we, uh, we were wearing a bathing suit uh, 
uh, but we did have a shoe that was left in the boat after it turned over, and with the shoe we managed to bail out most of the rest of the boat. Uh, then we, we sailed back home and got here just about the time the sun went down. So that was two of the more interesting experiences that we had. Isn't it true that in those days you were not required to have a life jacket, so you had no life jackets on board? I don't remember whether we That's did That's right, that. Barbara. And another thing about that boat I remember is that I think it was called a 16-foot knockabout. Winabout. Or winabout. Yeah. And uh, before we bought it, Dad consulted a lot of people, and uh, he was told that it was very dangerous to sail on Lake Winnipesaukee. And several people said they really didn't recommend having a sailboat, but he, he forged ahead, fortunately, and got the sailboat, and in the following years, sailboats multiplied on Lake Winnipesaukee. There were very few when we first had ours. Well, Barbara, as I recall, we had what may have been the first sailboat race on the lake, which involved two or three other boats, and we have a picture someplace around the house here with the boats coming across the lake in this direction with our craft fortunately being in the lead. I don't believe that any of our sailboats took place in a sailboat race after that, although many races now take place every summer. What year was that first race? Oh, that would have been in the middle 1930s. When did the first inboard boat come? Quite well, early. I the think. first in inboard boat uh, Dad bought in the first year that we were here. It was a 32 foot long, uh, what they called a, a Laker. Uh, it, it, it had a very large cockpit. There was one bench seat at the, at the bow, uh, toward the bow, uh, where the person who was driving the boat would sit, and there was room for th about three others uh, on, on that same bench. Behind that, it was all open, uh, and the, uh, the other passengers would, would sit on chairs in that open section. Uh, because of the design of the boat, every time we hit a wave, including the wake of another boat, uh, there'd be a, a, a wave of, of water that would, that would go over the whole boat and everybody in the boat would get soaking wet. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, for that reason, we, we usually carried a poncho uh, for each passenger in, in the boat, uh, but it, uh, it, it was a, an interesting experience. Uh, in the wintertime, we pulled that boat up in the, in the boathouse uh, a friend of Dad's, uh, who had a machine shop, made an ingenious system that, that, that we would use to, to lift the boat up. Uh, one spring we came up and found that over the winter the, the, uh, the, the uh, boat, the boat had, had gotten a little, was a little too heavy for the, the beam that was holding it up and, and the, the keel broke. So the, the boat was not very seaworthy after that, so the next boat was a, a Chris Craft, uh, which we acquired, I would think, about 1927. Maybe oh, later than maybe that, later Hugh, than because that. I remember the Laker. Yeah, you do. And well, I used to play on the, f on the floor of, of the Laker and use some of those ponchos to make a tent oh. <laughs> until uh, they were needed by, by people. I also remember that uh, the chairs we sat on were the wicker chairs that, that we still have and at, uh, during many summers those chairs are down in the summer house. They're sort of a, a faded red, reddish bronze uh, color now and they're, they're, they're beautiful chairs still. I think there were four or six of them. We have four left. 
One of the principal activities with any of the large boats that the family had was to load it up with everyone in the household on Saturday or Sunday and head off for a picnic, uh, preferably up to the north end of the lake in Green's Basin, where we would find a vacant spot along the shore, uh, tie the boat up, uh, and have an enjoyable picnic. Sometimes uh, we would go over toward the bridge that connects Long Island with the mainland and tie up there and use one of the nice beaches on either side of the lake, e on either side of the bridge. Uh, that activity, of course, uh, is completely impossible now because most of the shoreline has been filled up. One of the things I recall on the trip to Green's Basin was a not particularly impressive cottage uh, perched on the top of a rocky ledge and the name sign on it was October Morn. <laughs> Talk, talk about your canoe trips to Green's Basin. Well, I was just going to bring that up, Barbara. We didn't spend all our time in the motorboat. Uh, we, uh, we would go off in the, in the canoe and uh, uh, paddle around the lake until we found a nice beach. Uh, and then we would go in and, and, uh, and set up a camp there. Uh, in those days, uh, most people didn't have a tent. And uh, we didn't have any tent, and sleeping bags hadn't been invented. So we would take along a, uh, a few blankets and a poncho, and we would find a wooden pole in the woods somewhere where we were camping, and uh, stretch that between the trees, and then hang the poncho over that pole, uh, so that if it rained, we wouldn't get completely soaked. We would start off with uh, enough food to last us for a few days, uh, but occasionally we'd, we'd camp in a place where there were some friendly fishermen who would provide us with a couple of fish that we could cook over, over the fire. Uh, there were no restrictions on making a campfire in those days, but we usually built it on the beach. Uh, so we would, we would uh, spend uh, two or three days and and we would stay there until our food ran out, and then we'd paddle back home and uh, wait for the next week before we started off. At that time, there were practically no cottages on the lake, so we could go almost anywhere and find a deserted spot where we could, where we could go in and, and camp. So that was a... I think there's another aspect of our life here that represents a significant difference with, with what goes on today. Meals were always scheduled, and if anyone wanted to eat, and we were expected to eat, he or she had to be at his or her place on the dining room table at that time. The evening meal was, I believe, around 6 or maybe 6.30, and one of the aspects of that that I remember particularly was that after dinner, particularly during the week when guests were not around, mother would take us children out to what was our croquet field and we would have two or three rounds of croquet before the sun went down. You I guess at the same time this would have been in the early 1930s one of the ways that Hugh and I spent our time 
was swimming. We probably were in the water, or seemed to be in the water, more hours than we were out. We would go down to the boat house and dive off the dock, and the rougher the water was, the more we liked it. We just swam up and down on top of the waves for probably a half an hour, and then we would come out of the water and run out into the field where there was a lot of tall grass, and we would just lie down and warm ourselves up again. After uh, 15 or 20 minutes of that, which included talking to the crickets, mm -hmm. we would then go back into the water for another half hour of riding the waves. You remember that, Hugh? Yes, I do. And of course, when, when we weren't doing that, we would swim out to the raft, which at that time had a diving board and also a chute. So we would climb up the steps on the back of the chute and go dashing down into the water. That particular raft finally fell apart and I guess it was decided that the combination of the diving board and the chute were a little bit dangerous so we now have simply a raft that people can sunbathe on. Well, let me describe that, that raft. One of the most fun things about the raft was that it was built on barrels. And my friends and I could go out there and dive under the barrels and come up under the raft where there was air and we would spend hours diving under the raft and coming out again and back under and your voice sort of echoed under there so it was fun to, to go under the raft and have conversations. <laughs> uh, the other thing I remember about the raft is that uh, my brothers used to greatly enjoy taking me out to the raft and one would take my hands and the other would take my feet and they would swing me back and forth like a hammock and <laughs> after they'd swung four or five times, I would land in the lake, <laughs> screaming bloody murder and protesting, but loving it the whole time. That, that was a high point. You talked about friends. Were there many neighbors here, or were they friends who came up to visit? Mainly friends who came up to visit. I don't know. John and Hugh will have to talk about their friends. I had no friends, with the exception of two summers, which will always be the high points of my life here. When a family rented the house next door, I was about six years old, and that family had two little girls. Just, one was just older and the other was just younger, Betsy and uh, Eleanor. And their grandmother lived in Newton Center, and they came from Pennsylvania. And uh, we had a wonderful time. Uh, Betsy, the older one, and I sort of bonded, and. We used to enjoy ourselves by running away and hiding from Eleanor, and poor Eleanor never could find us, and that made her very unhappy, but it made us feel that we had triumphed somehow. And I guess before those girls came, I had al already started to create a little cabin for myself down by the lake. Uh, I had two, two locales. One was called Lakeside Cabin, and that was a place where uh, there was a great big rock and, and sort of a grassy area on, on the rock and it was sort of dug out by the water underneath. So you could sit in Lakeside Cabin and, and feel very isolated from the world because there were trees behind the big rock. So I could sit there and I think maybe one of the boys made some little furniture for me for for Lakeside Cabin. I know I had a little table. Maybe Dad did it. I'm not sure. But I had a little table 
and a couple of little chairs, and I had a little clock with the, made out of a piece of wood, and somebody put all the numerals on it and gave it little wooden hands, and I could adjust the clock as the minutes went by or the hours. And then after Lakeside Cabin, I wanted another locale, so I developed House in the Pines, and that was under an adjacent pine tree that had a lot of low-lying branches, and I could uh, cut away the some of the lowest branches and have a nice uh, pine needle bed there, and I could take blankets and a poncho out and occasionally sleep there. And I think the girls, as I called them, and I played around with Lakeside Cabin and House in the Pines, but mostly I played there by myself because the, there was no one else, but I had a lot of imaginary friends, and we, we had a great time. <laughs> well, Barbara, I can remember uh, the girl, Betsy and Eleanor, but they, they also had a brother uh, who was Ralph, and Ralph had a cousin whose name escapes me at the moment, but this provided some playmates for John and me. Uh, they also came with their grandfather, uh, who was a, a very genial fellow. He was, his name was Mr. Lewis. And Mr. Lewis uh, organized a, a number of projects. There were some large rocks which had been left around the place, and so he would get us engaged in removing the rocks. And we would dig down a little bit under the, under the rock, and then we'd get a long pole and use that to pry the rock up. Uh, he also found that the road coming down here, which was just a two-track path through the fields, uh, was in need of a little bit of improvement. So he would get us out there, and we would uh, take some shovels and pickaxes, and we'd, we'd loosen the, the soil on the road and, and level it off so it would be very smooth. And uh, that would uh, be a project that would, would last for a week or so, uh, and keep us occupied at constructing, constructing the road, and uh, probably uh, it uh, stood us in good stead as the years went on. Uh, did you have a question? Yeah, around here there were, only, you only had a few neighbors, then there was the farm, and when did the camps open near here? Like we were fully, fully grown before the campsites were developed. Mm -hmm. Mar married even. Did, weren't oh. you married before, I wasn't maybe, but you were married before Russell started renting out campsites? I was thinking of, of Belknap. <coughs> oh, the, oh, those camps. That camp. That's they that's, a, that's a hundred year, they're celebrating their hundredth year mm -hmm. this year. Uh, camp Belknap had been there when we arrived, and that reminds me, we, we really should talk a little bit about how we got down to the shore. <clears throat> this whole property had been a working farm and the area that was purchased by Mr. Drown in 1924 uh, had been a cow pasture. So it became necessary to install fences to control where the cows were located. And one result of that was that when a road was put in, which was really not much more than a, a pathway uh, for the four wheels of a car, when that road was put in, it went through either two or three fences. And this meant that every time we went in or out, somebody had to stop in front of each of those fences, row back two or three bars of wood, let the car drive through, and then somebody would put the bars back in position. Uh, that made the drive out to 109 not exactly a high-speed affair. <laughs> 
as time went by, those fences were eliminated, partly because some of the acreage behind the original lot was purchased by mother and dad, usually because the widow of one of the Whitten families needed money to pay bills that her husband had incurred while he was representing this part of the state down at the state legislature in Concord. Let me say a few words about the Witten family. Uh, mother and dad bought the land from uh, Mr. and Mrs. Witten. We called him Uncle Ned. What did we call her? Do you remember? Anyway, they had bought the land. I just heard this recently, John and Hugh. Perhaps you knew it. Uh, they they had bought the land sometime a bit earlier in this in the century, and. Uh, the land on what is called Chase Point at that time, they owned the whole point and the land comprised two miles of shorefront plus two islands that were nearby. I don't remember which islands they were. And when Uncle Ned came to buy the land, he said, well, I don't want the islands. I'll just buy the land. The, the price for the whole lot with the two miles of shorefront was $2,000. And when he said, I don't want the, the uh, islands, they knocked off $100 per island. So he paid $1,800 for all this property. Barbara, I think we should contrast that purchase price of $2,000 with the current price for a foot of shorefront property would be twice what Uncle Ned had paid for two miles of shorefront <laughs> plus a hundred acres of land. So who were the other Hugh, people who Hugh, do you have any in? recollections of, of Russell Whitten? He was yes, about your uh, age. Yeah, well gradually... He was the grandson of yeah, Uncle Ned. Yeah, uh, uh, Russell uh, got to be one of our friends, and we would occasionally do things with him. Uh, in the very early days, we would, uh, be before the house, before this house was built, we would uh, we came up in the summertime and stayed at the Witten Farm. They took boarders in the summer, and, and uh, we would stay there for uh, for a week or so at a time, and, and uh, we had very hearty meals. Uh, in the uh, in the dining room, and and we got to know Russell. So that by the time we came here, we'd get together with him from time to time. That was about halfway up the road in the old the halfway, old route. Halfway from here to Route 109. Right. Yes. And uh, uh, then uh, a number of houses were built along the shore, so that there were uh, other people our age that uh, we played with, and. Uh, Vernon Drown was was one. Uh, the Drowns had a daughter, uh, Libby. Libby, who was really more of a babysitter for us than, than a playmate. But uh, we we did have other people to play with. We also, uh, among the guests that that mother would would invite here, uh, were her friends who had children, or maybe relatives that had children. So we, we weren't completely without uh, people to do things with of our own age. And uh, that was a very enjoyable and, and, and important part of our, of our summers here. I mean. Then there, there were the Renaud girls who moved That's in right. next to Little Bear. Yeah, yeah they, they had four girls, but they were all, except one, a great deal older than, than, than we were. Uh, Ruth Renaud. One whose name was Ruth, uh, we did do things with. She liked to go horseback riding, so sometimes we would go off and, and, and uh, rent a horse uh, for, for each of us and spend the afternoon riding. Uh, 
Yeah. How far did you have to go to ride a horse? Well, about halfway to Alton. And uh, the last time we saw her was when John had just arranged to buy a house in uh, Westchester County, New York. And uh, we went to talk to a lawyer uh, who would handle the legalities of buying this house. And who do we run into but Ruth Renault <laughs> with her new husband. Do you remember that, John? No. As we went into the courthouse, there was Ruthie standing on the steps. Really? Yeah. And that's the last time we saw her and never heard anything from her again. Well, they sold the house. Yeah, so they, they sold the house. Some years before uh, that. Then on the other side, you had the Woodwards and then the Brims. Yeah. And the Woodwards were the, the most conspicuous by far. Yes. Yes, because they had a big white boathouse right on the lake. And a long like breakwater. Later, later moved up onto shore to, to uh, build a house. It was remodeled into a house by the, what was their name? Not Hatfield. Um, what was the name of uh, Natalie's parents? Uh, I don't even, I well, can't think of Never now. mind. And then on the point, the Brims owned a, a beautiful house that had a lovely uh, gazebo on the right on Chase Point, at the tip of that. Chase Point. I haven't been around the point. Is that still there? The yeah. point is still there. Yeah, the point, but it's less. a gazebo. The, uh, no, I think, I, I'm not sure. I think it's gone. And uh, Oh, it's still there, and it is owned by a gentleman who whose name escapes me, but Grosbeck. He, what? Gro Grosbeck, Grosbeck, who developed uh, the cable company. Continental Cable Vision. Continental Cable Vision. Uh, he owns two, two houses on Sewell Road. He bought the Chase Point property from the Mrs. Schulte. Mrs. Schulte. Mrs. No. I guess you're right. It was Mrs. Schulte. Uh, her husband had been an executive with Lever Brothers in Boston. Uh, she sold the house for a million and a quarter dollars, and Grosbeck bought it with the intention of subdividing at least one lot was supposed to be sold to a good friend. Somehow that deal fell through, and although the entire property on the point has been on the market for around three million dollars, nobody has picked it up and unfortunately the house on the property has not been occupied since Grosbeck bought it, so the whole building is gradually deteriorating. Now the, the, the Brims were an interesting family, they came from Dayton, Ohio, and I guess... Uh, the Brims. The Brims, you the said. The Brims. Yes. The Brims came from Dayton, Ohio, and had sold what I guess had been a, a family manufacturing business to General Motors. They had three daughters and a somewhat younger son. The, daughters more or less moved away from here and we haven't heard a great deal of them or from them until just recently we had a phone call from Mary Agnes who was visiting in the area and called to say hello. Well one of those daughters, uh, Betty, married Elton Wolfert and she bought the house after her parents had sold Chase Point she bought the house next door and she lived there for 10 or 15 years with her husband and they had two sons and a daughter and only when she died did, did that property get sold to someone else and their very attractive uh, modest house was torn down or remodeled into a, a mini mansion mm -hmm. by the person who bought it and I forget who that is. Now your parents had an opportunity to buy the, the Woodward 
property and I guess oh yes uh, in Percy Woodward's will which he, he died in the late 1940s in his will he provided that his executor should offer his entire property to us for eighteen thousand dollars we talked about it we said we already have two cottages and they take up as much time as we can find to simply maintain them and what would we do with a third cottage even though it's the adjoining property so we turned down that very generous offer on the part of Percy Woodward's executor and passed up something that today would be worth well over a million dollars. Who, who were your neighbors to the south? You've talked mostly about people up to the north. Oh, to the south was the Renaud Cottage. Oh. Okay. And then beyond that, the Renaud's was where the Merrills the later Renaud, were. The Renaud Cottage was sold to the Merrills. Uh, the Merrills were an interesting family. Uh, they had lived in China uh, for quite a few years. Uh, he was an executive with uh, the uh, Standard Oil Company in, in China. And uh, his particular job was uh, taking care of the problems that their tankers had as they went up the Yangtze to uh, deliver the oil to whatever depots it was headed for. Uh, when World War II started, our government discovered that they, although they were going to have uh, operations in the Far East, particularly to combat the Japanese, that they didn't have any maps of the waterways around the, the uh, China coast. Uh, but uh, Mr. Merrill uh, had been active enough in, in setting up uh, aids to navigation uh, around China so that he could draw maps from memory. And we understood that that was a big help for the US Navy in their operations there during World War II. He had come back from, from uh, China and, and uh, bought the, the cottage, the Renault cottage next door. Uh, he had two girls uh, who were about our age and from time to time we would get them over for a game of tennis or something and, and uh, they, were, they were quite interesting. Uh, although we, we haven't seen much of them in, in recent years one of them got married and moved out to St. Louis, and the other one uh, was living in, in New Hampshire uh, and uh, came here occasionally with her husband. So uh, we did have uh, some... Talk about some of your real girlfriends up here. <laughs> oh, Barbara, my <laughs> lips are sealed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know... Oh. When I was growing up, the, the people that you all associated with the most were farther down the shore, that, just beyond true. the Merrills. Well, ex explain how we happened to get Little Bear, and then we can talk more about the drowns. <coughs> yeah, we have about six minutes to go. <coughs> well, <coughs> in the Depression years, in the 1930s, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Mr. Drown had been in the real estate business, and there wasn't much real estate activity, uh, I guess his specialty was mortgages, and they were in real financial straits to the point that they were having difficulty paying their real estate taxes, and mother and dad arranged to purchase the cottage from them for approximately what it, it had cost to build it in the first place. In those days, we didn't have inflation, so the value of property didn't change very much from year to year. After it was purchased, 
1937, uh, Little Bear was expanded in several directions, and the dining room was made larger, the kitchen was made larger, and I believe a bathroom was added on the second floor. If I'm correct in that, the house originally had only uh, the lavatory on the first floor, no shower, uh, people did their bathing in the lake. <laughs> And, and af after Little Bear became available, uh, there were times when a Mother would arrange for some of her relatives to come up and spend some time there, I guess occasionally paying rent, but maybe not always. Well, Aunt Henrietta was there one year, and she, she did a lot of decorating and picked out some very nice curtains for Little Bear and some china and a lot of nice little touches were, were added. Well, all of the... Most of which have gone now because they got worn out. But <laughs> the, the china is still there. So some of the china is still there. Uh, and the curtains lasted until a couple of years ago uh, <laughs> when it was still serviceable. But uh, some of the members of the family decided it was looking kind of seedy. So they replaced it with, with other curtains that uh, were. Okay, we've got about three minutes left. Anybody else you'd like to talk about down the shore or in town? Well, I s we, we've told you the story about the, the drowns, and we've mentioned their, their son Vernon and their daughter Libby, but they had an older son, Ted, and they were all devoted to the lake and uh, after their parents had sold Little Bear and uh, after Ted was fully grown, he, he and his wife bought some land below the, uh, the Renaud and then the Merrill house and they, they built a house there and Vernon Drown bought some land on the North Shore and he built a house there. I thought he had a tent there at one point. He started out with a tent. Subsequently, he had a house, and at one point, he lived in that house year-round with his wife and son and daughter, I believe. And he ultimately sold, and Ted ultimately sold, and had a house on an island just across next to Whittlebury Island, and also a house in Tuckenboro, high on a hill with a beautiful view of the lake. Uh, Vernon what? died, but before that, he had a very nice place on 109 uh, on the other side of uh, Melbourne Village and had a, a, a quite active plumbing business after having spent a number of years as manager of Sears Roebuck store. Uh -huh. Today, are, are we out of time? We've got two minutes. Two minutes yeah, left. Yeah, you could talk about the, I don't know, Wormans, Goddards. Oh, the other loose end. We haven't talked about remodeling this house and how it grew from something very small. The kitchen was about a quarter the size of what it is now originally. The, the, uh, the wing where the sink is wasn't there. The wing where the, what we call the summer kitchen wasn't there. Uh, there was a, an ice box in the in the corner of the kitchen. The outside corner was where the, uh, what do you call it, where you eat it? Oh, like a breakfast nook or? Barbara, we should oh. mention too that the, the, uh, in the kitchen, the, the source of uh, cooking was a wood stove with, uh, fueled with uh, birch, small birch logs. Uh, the first few summers that we were here in the 1920s, there was a crew of carpenters around every summer. And then in 1937, there was a major expansion of the house on both the west side and the east side, practically doubling the size of the living room and making a number of other improvements. So that this tumbling has literally grown not quite like 
gradually over the years. And after I, I think Mother spent her winters dreaming up things that could be done here at Tumbleweed. And one of the more interesting structures, the, the, the first summer we were here, they built the boathouse and the, the uh, little shed that, that we call the uh, summer house. Uh, but there was also a, a, a structure that uh, was raised up on post. It was probably 10 feet up in the air, uh, which was called the crow's nest. And, and this was simply a, a structure that was probably 10 feet square with benches all around the side of it. And uh, you'd, you'd walk up a flight of stairs and, and uh, get a much different view of the lake because it was somewhat higher than, than, than the house. And uh, that was a, a favorite place for us to go up and sit and, and read a book or a magazine. Uh, and on summer days, it was, it was very pleasant. Unfortunately, the crow's nest disappeared in one of the storms up here. I don't remember when that happened, uh, but we don't have a crow's nest any longer. One fact we didn't mention is the time, is that uh, the fact that the meals were served at very set hours had something to do with the fact that there was a cook in residence, and she lived in originally in what is now the laundry, which was a single